that come through, you know, while we're doing it. I see. Yeah. Okay. Great. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, Hello. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy you got to join us today for another uh, virtual art talk uh, where everybody is in the same place, but we're all on, everybody's in a different place, but we're all on the same page. And of course, today our special guest is Barbara Earl Thomas. And just through a, a, a completely unexpected accident of timing, and Barbara, when I first invited you to do this, I didn't even know about your show at Sam, but it turns out that Barbara has a, a, a one-person show at Sam called uh, The Geography of Innocence, and it opened in November and promptly closed after three days for all the obvious reasons. So we get the pleasure of doing a virtual walkthrough of this show that nobody else in Seattle can see until the governor and uh, the COVID gods decide it's safe to go back into the Seattle Art Museum. So it's, it's a very cool coincidence. I mean, it's not a good coincidence because, you know, Barbara's show is closed, but it's, you know, we do get to enjoy the show. And uh, I was very brokenhearted when Barbara sent me her PowerPoint because the show looks so gorgeous. And I said, Barbara, nobody's going to get to see this show, but it turns out it's up for a year. So if we're not back in business, before, I said, who cares? We'll just yeah. all like killed ourselves. Yeah, before <laughs> this show goes down. I mean, that's, you know, then it's all over for everybody. Anyway, so Barbara uh, Earl Thomas is um, this longtime mainstay of the Seattle art scene. And Barbara, I'm really sad that there is no female equivalent. Uh, another example of historical male chauvinism for the very useful term Renaissance man. <laughs> I'll take it. Because, yeah, because if there was, I mean, you are a Renaissance man, but the problem is there is no female way to say that. <laughs> and the reason I say that about Barbara is that after getting her art degrees, and she got two of them from the University of Washington, MA and uh, a BA and an MFA, and she studied with uh, and became close to uh, two of their super mainstays in recent years, uh, Michael Spafford and Jacob Lawrence, you know, both of whom had a big influence on her career. After that, she's had a really interesting career. Uh, she was on the Seattle Art Commission. Uh, she helped to start and was the executive director of the Northwest Museum of African uh, African American art, or I'm not getting the, the name of the museum right. And uh, plus, she has been an exhibiting artist for years and years. And she decided finally to give up the arts administration side of her practice and just focus on the art. And uh, if you go on her website, she's had a really interesting career. And she's particularly done a lot of public art uh, uh, in recent years. And so you'll, you'll just run into her stuff when you're doing things like, you know, riding sound transit or, uh, you know, walk or, or, or going between here or, or, or visiting Portland. She's got some pieces there. Anyway, so uh, we're thrilled. We're, so we're going to focus today mostly, almost entirely on the show, The Geography of, uh, of Innocence. And uh, Barbara, by the way, it did also occur to me that uh, I think you're the only executive director of a major Seattle arts organization ever to have a one person show at the Seattle Art Museum. <laughs> I think that's probably a pretty safe statement. So that's really wearing a couple of, of, of very distinguished hats. So anyway, Barbara, um, let's go ahead and uh, fire up our PowerPoint and start to look at uh, your work. And as always with these art talks, everyone, um, we, um, um, we, we, we've got the chat line open uh, and you know that with Zoom, you can, you can submit questions via chat and Barbara is happy to uh, comment and uh, we'll have a, a, a Q and A period at the end of our talk. So that there are few enough people here that we can be pretty conversational. 
Okay. And, yeah, it looks like they're, you know, they're not hundreds of people. So we can be very conversational and some of the people I know. So there you go. All right. So uh, uh, Erica, that Barbara's telling us we could leave our mics open as long as nobody has a barking dog or a screaming car alarm. And uh, if somebody wants to fire up a question, Barbara's happy to take it. So um, we'll, uh, Barbara, let's go ahead and go into the PowerPoint. We'll go back and look at this image again in a minute. So um, a lot of what we're gonna be looking at, I guess everything we're gonna be looking at with a couple of exceptions is going to be paper cutout or Tyvek cutout based. So Barbara, you were saying that these represent uh, kind of uh, earlier versions of your working with uh, cutout? Yeah, uh, well, what these are, and the reason I, I gave them to you for the PowerPoint is because I actually, to everyone, I haven't been doing this paper cut thing a very long time. I've been doing it basically four years. And I started and I did it starting, I had a show at the Bainbridge Island Art Museum in 2016. And one of the goals that I had for that show, uh, I worked with Greg Robinson, who's a you know really dear person. And he wanted to do this career survey thing with my work. And I said, well, great, you can do a career survey, go out and find all the stuff you can find you want. But I would like one third of that floor because they put it in the whole upper floor of the museum. And I said, I'd like one quarter or one third of the, um, floor to do new work. And that's what I'm interested in is the new work. And uh, so I decided that because it was going to be kind of an experimental thing for me, I wanted to do um, work that was bigger and I could move around. And so I got these two walls, that, I don't know, they're 13, uh, you know, 12 feet by six feet or something. And I just, got these rolls of Tyvek and I started cutting my narratives out of that, um, you know, out of that material. And then I would pin them to the wall. And so that's what you just saw, the piece oh, that I'm you- sorry. Yeah, that, I actually did. And so, and I, what, what, I was, what I was interested in was being able to do these uh, dramatic scenes that were more than life-size and do it in a way that it was not so precious. I could move the things around. And if I got it right on the wall and I wanted to move something that was like above the head of one of the figures, I could unpin it and I could move it. And so Greg was kind enough to let me do that. And then I also built my first illuminated room there. And uh, it was, I think probably 12 feet by six feet or something, or maybe 10 by 10, I can't remember quite, but it was a little room that was, all the walls were hand cut. And so those were my two intros. And you can see from looking at these that, um, you know, they're wide and kind of large sweeps. The red is actually um, some kind of bond paper that, you know, rag paper that I was using, but everything else is Tyvek. And these are large, I mean, they're like, you know, six feet by eight feet, and, you know, and so I, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to do something really big and not precious, but also where I could be graphic and narrative um, and really physically engaged in the work. Uh, okay, well, I want to go on to the Sam show in a second, but Barbara, I've been looking at this piece and uh, Blood Catcher because of the, well, I guess the title is ambiguous, but is the, so the one on the left, is the blood going up or is it going down? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's, it's both. I mean, the blood catcher, I mean, it's, it's um, I did the whole show was about uh, bloodletting. You know, I'd done a lot of research on, you know, bloodletting as a healing um, method in, you know, the, in, in the 18th, 17th, 18th century, you know, they would bleed people. And so the whole idea that you would do something meant to be good but actually, in reality, it turns out to be the very opposite of what you think it's doing. So I have these people in various sort of forms. And, you know, of course, the way we do it, you know, you need, you know, you have something dramatic and want the eye to go down. So I've got the blood going down and the guy is catching it, but it's actually going through his arms into a, into a pot that's below and then it's flowing out of the pot. 
And they actually in the museum, I had it go kind of right down to the floor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, there's one last sort of pre Seattle Art Museum piece, uh, also piece. done in Tyvek. And this piece is a, actually a 2D piece that after I did that show at uh, in um, at the Bainbridge, then I thought, you know, I need to kind of capture these pieces. I was going to be in, I think it was a Chicago art fair. And I thought, well, I still want to do those Tyvek pieces, but I've got to be able to capture them and be able to kind of put them together so that they can be sent and they can be presented in a way that someone can pick it up and take it away. So, but I still want to do my narrative. So what you see here is black Tyvek hand cut over again, um, hand colored paper that, I mean, a hand printed color underneath the, um, the hand cut Tyvek. And you can see, I have the word flee written across and through the clouds. And you see there's a train going and there's someone jumping out of the top of the train and jumping off the train and and uh, cars coming and people are kind of, you know, you, you, it's a little bit of a mystery and I kind of like the idea of that. And so there's, and then I have the word exit. And I think that um, for me that, sometimes a little bit ambiguous narrative in words, but the words that are also part of the composition. It's really interesting to me because people just impose whatever their thoughts and feelings are. And I have this thing about when you walk by houses at night and you look through the windows and you can see those backlit lit, lit people in there. And my thought is always, who would I be if that was my life in there? Uh, so this reminds me in my introduction, one of the reasons I was, uh, 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 you know, commenting on Barbara qualifying for the Renaissance man in air quotes is uh, she's also an author and she writes a lot about art. And what we'll see is that words are really important to her work um, and uh, a kind of a literary kind of cross fertilization. Uh, and so a lot of these pieces you know, like the piece on the left here, you know, the word is central to the meaning of the piece uh, from what I've heard Barbara say about it, this piece on the left. And just a comment here. So the, the as we'll see, the show at the Seattle Art Museum consists of two halves or two parts or two rooms, I guess would be better way to put it so there are these very large portraits and you gotta appreciate you know these are big pictures we can't appreciate that on zoom of course and so these line the corridor i guess barbara there's about eight of these portraits there's that ten, that? 10 actually and yeah. there are eight in the nine in the corridor and then one inside of the illuminated room okay so then you walk down this corridor with these very dramatic portraits and then you walk into what Barbara's calling the illuminated room, which I think of as sort of a chapel like or a sanctuary space that's all about light and movement. And so we'll start by looking at the portraits and then we'll go look at, you know, uh, the illuminated room as our as our sort of tour through the show. So Barbara, why don't you introduce us to these portraits, you know, who the people are and the process, you know, the whole bit. Well, um, the show came about, um, I got offered the show a little bit less, a little bit over a year ago. So I, I didn't really have much time. Uh, most, most of the time when you get a museum show, it's usually two years out at least. But you know, what did I do? I, I just seized the moment and said, I actually wanna do all new work. I don't have work that exists for this subject and this, um, this effort I want to do. And this whole show was based on reading that I did uh, two, two bodies of work. One was by an essay by uh, James Hillman, who was a very well-known um, Jungian therapist. And he wrote an essay called uh, Notes on White Supremacy in 1986, all before all this fragility stuff. And then I read a book by, um, 
a Japanese author um, whose last name was Tanizaki. I can't remember his first name, but it's, it, the book was called In Praise of Shadows. And both of them talked about how deeply embedded in our mythology and in our psyche is how we think of what is light and what we think of as dark and how they have you know, emotional and cultural and religious and mythological meaning that really suffuse the whole way we, and I don't just say we, the United States, but how the world, you know, experiences, you know, what is reality. So uh, with that said, I thought, you know what, all this light and dark, all this white and black, it's, it's got power that actually is operating on us that's really bigger than who we are. It's bigger than all our racial problems. It's bigger and uh, more pervasive and more subtle than maybe we can even think about. And I'm, you know, I don't care if other people don't know that, but that's what got me into this. And I thought, what is it about, you know, um, especially, you know, looking at kids of color that have people sometimes afraid and uh, have them reading into them certain kinds of knowledge that or certain kinds of intent that they actually don't have and um and and on the on one side i'm talking about kids of color but then the other the other example i thought of is that young that young child her name was jean benet she was a, a young her parents had her she was a model and she was like six or eight years old and she got killed. But she, they would dress her up and she would be just this beautiful little woman child. And I thought, what was the fantasy that people had when they looked at this little eight-year-old or nine-year-old that was dressed up like a 40-year-old woman? And what did they bring to that? Because they got confused by what was being presented as opposed to what was. So anyway, I thought that's all about how we see and how we read, uh, we read an image or a person that's coming toward us. So my whole, my whole sort of idea here was to present these children at that moment before we laid upon them our preconception and before they started to give back to us the uh, social and cultural cues that they've been taught to give back to us. So it's that moment of innocence that I wanted to capture and to present to people. And uh, these two boys are actually not two that I know. I started this, uh, this series, I gone online and in Chicago, they had a campaign and it was called the Don't Shoot campaign. And, uh, in this, in the one boy that has grace in his hand, he was actually holding a sign that said, don't shoot, I want to grow up. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah there he is. And I yeah. thought, you know, what if I put in his hand, not what we don't want to happen. What if I put in his hand what I do want to happen? And so I just went through, I, I'd be in the studio cutting and I just lay out a whole list of words until I came to this one word. And it was the right word, it was the right shape, and it was the right sound. And so my boy has grace. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I want everybody to understand that what we're looking at here is a sandwich where there's a black paper cutout, and then behind it are these, um, it, uh, Barbara was telling me before we started, these professionally printed uh colored papers that she's got that's her palette so she's got a whole mess of them in her studio and then she puts them behind the cutouts to get the colors that she wants uh and barbara there must be something metaphorically very fascinating that with every cut you make you're bringing the light into your portraits it's the reveal and I think that that word is really important because what I would like to do is to reveal something to the eye, reveal something to the viewer that the viewer may not have perceived before. But now because I've caught this moment for you, 
you have a moment, you have the opportunity to see between, you know, see between the two moments. So that's what I'm doing and, and trying to keep it simple so that you're not overly odd with just the color saturation, but in fact, you can read the image. And so, and it's so, I, as I said, it's very graphic. Yeah, no, as the series progresses, you start to get obviously into uh, more elaborate settings for these, um, for these figures. Uh, and uh, uh, do you wanna talk about bringing the, and we have two versions of this. Um, I don't know, would you rather look at the more recent one or, or the older one? This is, the, this is the older one. This is 2019. And I guess the reason, again, I put them in there is because I tend to be, uh, you know, because I do write and because I think writing, the most important or most interesting part of writing for me is the editing. Because that's right before you're going to, you know, you refine everything or some of the builder. I think the most important part about being a builder is the finished work. You know, those little things where you put those nice little details and you really finish it off well. Well, I, when I first started doing this, and um, these are the first of this kind that I did after you, the piece Flee. And this is not using Tyvek. This is a, a, a sort of, and this is holding fire number two. Um, this is 2020. So it's the same model, the same composition, but here is more than a year later. And I've gotten, I think I've gotten better. So I like to do both of them and look back at the same sort of composition and see how I've changed my, um, you know, what aesthetic choices I've made between holding fire one and holding fire two. So you see, I've revealed, I've used more, I've revealed more of the color. There's a little bit more illumination happening. And um, actually the uh, likeness to my model is a lot, is a lot more, um, it's a lot closer. So that was kind of what happened there. And they're both the same model, but you see they're both the same composition, just um, nine or 10 months difference in their making. Yeah, and then however long it takes you to do each version, right? Because yeah. it's not like a quick sketch. Um, it's not, it's it's not, it's, a, it's more than a notion. And I now just, you know, it's, it's construction, it's a construction problem. And uh, also making sure that the papers are put down in a way that, you know, you're not getting caught up on the, you know, the seams or anything like that, because anything like that is going to distract and, and just, I don't know, get in the way of what I want you to see. Are there questions that people have of, as I'm going along? Anybody? Uh, actually, I did have a question. Um, what mm -hmm. is that black paper? I mean, what did you use instead of the Tyvek that would eliminate? It's, just, it's a black cover. It's a black rag cover stock. Oh, okay. That's all. And it's about 80 pound, um, 80 between 80 and 60. I go back and forth deciding which one I like. And it's, it's uh, you know, what's the smooth, it's the smooth milled as opposed to the one with pits. So um, that's what I use. And it's, um, and I sometimes make them bigger than the piece of paper because I can cut the paper in half and make it as big as I want to. Um, so I'm not limited by the size of the pay paper at all. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and Barbara, a lot of these, the more you look at them, you know, the more you see these, um, uh, these tiny uh, extra elements, like uh, for sure, I mean, Bailey that we're gonna be looking at later on has this screaming figure in the background that I didn't notice till about the 10th time I looked at it. And this one, um, there seems to be a figure on the right who's gesturing, you know, next to the holding and holding fire. And of course she's got that little flame. And then there's the house uh, and that house appears quite a lot. Um, uh, you know, in others of these images, obviously some kind of symbolic reference to the concept of home. So you want to talk about any or all of these, of these, uh, you know, these sort of symbols or ideas that surround your main model? Well, I think that, you know, again, I, I tend not to be too tricky. You know, I'm not trying to be the least bit, you know, I'm not trying to be, I'm, I'm not, 
I'm being subtle in certain ways, but I certainly, the house is like the symbol of home and the whole idea of, of the fact that, you know, in any, in any event, fire is the kind of thing that serves us well until it's out of control. And also the idea, again, of the sound of the title, holding fire. You can hold fire, literally, you hold fire. That'll save you a lot of trouble if you're, you know, you can hold fire. You can, there, there's a term and, you know, to hold, you know, sort of to hold a moment and to contain it and to control it so that you use it for whatever the best qualities of that element is. And that's to warm, that's to, to offer to other people. It's, it's all those things. It's, it's the offering. And then the fact that it's on the dress of the, of the woman that's uh, doing it. And in her dress is a drama that's happening. You know, people are falling through her hands. People are on her hands. Actually, you can't quite make it out here, but there's a figure that's got its hands over its head and the fire is just on the other side of that figure. And so, I mean, I like to have things where when you're looking at it, it looks like pattern, but then when you finally do, do if you decide to delve into it, there's a whole, there are all kinds of dramas going on. And I feel like that's just like life. You know, you've got the main thing happening, you know, you've got the election, you've got COVID, but yet and still, you've got all these dramas going on in every home and every city and state. And those dramas are, not less important, they're just, but they are in the middle ground as opposed to the foreground. And I just like to refer to the fact that at any time, at any moment, all these things are happening. And it's a fairly spontaneous intuitive process as you work on these, right? Even though you're using this kind of unforgiving material of paper cuts. Well, I think that what I do is I have the, the main figure or the figures that I'm doing and then uh, I allow myself when I'm cutting to just go kind of go like, okay, I think I want this here now. And then I just cut it. And um, as opposed to, you know, having something all totally drawn out and all totally in my, you know, sort of my template. I mean, that would not be as interesting to me as to, as having it be at the moment I'm there and I'm looking at her and I'm looking at her hands. And I said, I think I'm going to make this, you know, this trumpet vine kind of look like it's falling from her hands and from the trumpet vine would be falling this um, figure. And in the in, uh, Holding Fire One, I didn't have it like that. And in fact, I wasn't even doing trumpet vines really at that time. So you see it's a different piece, but it's the same, you know, same basic, it's the same person and the same basic con uh, concept. But you gotta be decisive, right? Cause you don't, you do. I'm assuming you don't get do-overs. You know, you know, there's ways you can fix all of this, but I don't want to have to do that. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, it's pretty clear what, the, you know, what things can happen and um, how I want the eye to move. And so you kind of just take a deep breath and cut. Uh, Barbara, by the way, I think this is my favorite of the uh, portraits. Yeah, I just love the light behind her. Uh, and it's funny, even as we talk, I found like a couple figures that I hadn't noticed before. So what I like about that is the last one. So oh. I always like it that the last one I cut is the one you like the best. Oh, oh, is this the most recent one? Yeah, that was the last. That was the one. The last one I finished. And how recent is recent? About four weeks ago. Oh man! Just before I... the show, just before the show opened. Oh, I mean, man. that's what that's what we mean by all new work. And this piece uh, was. I think it's kind of it's kind of the the anchor piece that everybody gets drawn to, but. I actually like cutting, holding fire quite a bit. So, but it, it, this piece actually has all the elements that you'll see sometimes reoccurring, you know, as I go forward. And this little boy, his name is Levi. And I actually do know him because his, his, his mom, his grandmother is my first cousin. So Levi came to my studio with his mom and he was here and I thought, hmm, he's, very adorable. So I said, Levi, come stand over here. Let me take a few photos of you. Do, do this for me. And that was the thing about, you know, the, the kids is that, and that's what I wanted to capture is that before kids are posturing for you, before you're having some sort of, I don't know, laying some kind of like in, you know, expectation on them, kids want to do, they want to please you. They want to give you what you want. 
So I said, will you stand here? And he just did everything I did. And he, he didn't know what I was going to do with it. He just trusted me. So I wanted to, I could see that right away. And I wanted to capture that quality in Levi. And then as I put the composition, that color wheel that's over his head was actually, it's on my wall here. And he was standing under it. And, and as I was um, putting together the composition, I said, now the color wheel, now there is an interesting symbol and a kind of a metaphor for where we are. And so I just reproduced the color wheel, cut myself a color wheel, and then you can't read it at the top, but there's the white and the kind of the green color. And it says, add white, add black, you know, so you're adding white to, you know, to, to tint that tone, add black to make the shade. And um, so I thought for people who are color people or for people who are painters, they would look at that and they'd know, they go, oh yeah, that's color wheel. And then the book titles are ones that, um, all these books that I think that over time actually tell the story of, um, of a young black boy in our culture, starting with Richard Wright, going to Notes of a Native Son, which is a James Baldwin, and then coming to ta Coates, Between the World and Me. So for people who have read those books, that will make a difference to them. For people who haven't, it's just some interesting words. So, um, you don't have to know all that to look at the piece and hopefully find something of interest in it for yourself. And so um, the uh, stained glass window association is really interesting to me because, you know, I know that you've talked about in other interviews and so forth, kind of, you know, biblical narratives and associations. So is that something that sort of emerged as you worked on it or is that, part of what you were thinking about? Because this one really, you know, suggests stained glass window to me anyway. Well, I think, you know, there are things that are in my mind that um, sort of symbolize uh, ways of looking at things. And of course, that's something I've worked in glass now, off and on for the last, like since 2014, I had a residency at the uh, Tacoma Glass Museum. And then I had a residency at Pilchuck and working in both those places, there are something about glass, of course, it's very attractive and cloying and magical because it's all about light and it's all about how light is transmitted. And once you fall in love with something like that, you're, you're going for the look, you know? At least I am, I'm going for the look. How can I make that happen? How can I make the color fades and the eye move in a way that suggests light? And how can that light be as much part of the subject as the figure in the composition? So that's what I'm doing. And um, in some, it works better than others, but that's, that's what I'm going for. Well, you're ready for your first window. I mean, that wouldn't be a big stretch at this point. Well, I'm doing windows for Yale um, starting, you know, well, I got the, uh, what is it, a commission. So I'll be doing windows. They're, they're not big and they're not, you know, Elaborate. Elaborate, but I'll, I'll be able to do the windows, so it'll be good. And it's not the first time I've done windows, but it's the first time I've done them for a public commission. Um, um, okay, so uh, uh, I'll just let leave it to you to make any individual comments about these portraits as we, as we go through them. Mm -hmm. And so this one is, it, uh, this is called Wonder Boy. And again, these now are of children I know, I know this little boy, his mom, his name, her name is Alicia B. Johnson. Her grandfather, who I know is Charles Johnson, the author and who's won every award known to mankind. And so in, this is a f image of uh, Emory when he got his first library card. And so on his book bag, it says, I got my library card and there's a, uh, image at the bottom it says boy science wonder and the reason that's there is because his grandfather and his mom wrote a series of books called the the boy science wonder and it's a little black boy who's interested in science and he goes on these science adventures and uh, and so it's all about Emory so for people who have read those again and the book titles here are book titles uh, from Charles's uh, a body of work. So uh, 
Dreamer is one of his books. It was about Martin Luther King. And then uh, Middle Passage, that was another one of his books. And then I put on the spine, Black Boys Read, because it was there was a whole big brouhaha or just some kind of stupid conversation. It must have been about 15 years ago that Black people don't read. So I thought I'd put, you know, Black kids reading. So that's what this one is a little bit about. But again, it's it's about the composition and it's about a little boy that I actually know. And so all these kids have come, it was great. They went the first day of the preview. So they all stood by their um, image and took pictures of next to their thing. Okay, during that three day window, yeah. Exactly. You know, when the museum was open. Okay, so Barbara, I gotta ask you, um, uh, when you're talking about this window when you know, these kids are, uh, you know, before the kids get, start to, uh, have to deal with the you know the grim realities or the the less savory parts of you know what they're going to have to contend with that they get as they get older what is the age range that you're thinking of with these kids you know well, the geography well, of innocence period well, the, 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 the age range i picked was somewhere between just because you know between six and ten Okay. You know, so I just, so they're somewhere between six and 10. And um, some of the kids that I have here are actually not kids anymore. These, are, you'll see one true North I have in here. That's a young man who I knew at that age and he's now 42. Whoa. <laughs> and um, the reason I wanted to do him was because I feel like what I'm talking about is, you know, we, we go and we make, and it's nothing, it's good. You know, you make pictures of all the kids who have, died in these horrible ways or who had their, this is him, you know, you see Nate right back there and you see this image of him. Well, I knew, I knew him when he was younger than the, the photo back there. And um, I wanted to say what we get if we're able to make sure these children live a full life is their whole future. And so right now, Nate is 44. He's got two kids. He's a master gardener and he does food justice around Seattle. And what if we'd missed that? I mean, what if we hadn't gotten to have that? No, he's not James Baldwin. He's not Tan He's Coates, but he's a contributing, he's a contributing um, citizen. And so I wanted to honor the fact that and on his, and you know, I took his photo and I redid everything. And I, he had on his, actually was on his t-shirt before I changed everything. It said the Alamo, cause he and his mom is my best friend and his mom, they'd gone to Texas and somehow he ended up with an Alamo t-shirt. I said, well, that's not what I want. And so I decided, what are we looking for? This is about geography. We're all trying to find our true North. And true North is sort of like for you, find yourself emotionally and sort of spiritually in the landscape of your life. So that's why I think that's important in there. Again, I gotten, I didn't, it, this time it's not a, a color wheel, but I got to make a compass. I like tools like that. So anytime I can make them and put them somewhere and have them be part of my composition, it's a, it's a nice, happy coincidence. So, you know, artists never make it easy for themselves. So, uh, I just want you to think about the fact that when Barbara decides she wants to do a compass or a ruler, all that stuff has to be cut out by hand. It does, yeah. <laughs> all those little letters, all those little tick marks. So, uh, you know, it's not casual to say, oh, I'm going to do a compass today. You know, you're, it's a big commitment. And there's that house again up there in the top. Yep. And then again, that's about geography. It's about how we travel. And, you know, I'm thinking about we travel you know, through our whole life. And then the fact that he is a master gardener and that he's outside and he loves nature. And at the very end, I was looking at him and I said, you know what? He needs a dragonfly, man. So <laughs> I decided that he needed a dragonfly. So I gave him one. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you've really succeeded in making these really positive and appealing portraits. I mean, you know, each one, I mean, here is uh, Luba with the cat. Mm -hmm. um, this is Luba called and, in Paradise, and um, her mom is a, a dress designer. Her mom is a clothing designer, and she they live right up the street. And um, 
and I saw these images of her and she's about this age anyway. So she, she actually is the age that she's depicted here. And I decided to, um, you know, and I love the idea she was holding this cat because I don't have a cat in anything else. And, um, you know, I just wanted it to be cheerful. But then of course, so you got the snakes, you got all the things that happen in a garden. And we're always like that in life, aren't we? We're trying to have nature and balance it out, but also have whatever the beauty of life is. And so there you have Luba and Luba's cat, and there's a hummingbird. And you can tell that this is a later one because again, I just started putting these vines in the last, in the last four months because I started in August and I was outside. I said, hmm, I'm, I think I would like that. But on a walk and I saw a trumpet vine and I thought, I think I'll, I'll, I'll put that in there. I just have to say as an aside, it's unheard of to have only a year to prep for a museum show. I mean, uh, uh, I would be on, I would, I, you know, I, I would be on tranquilizers the whole year. I it's mean, stressful. It's, it's stressful. Yeah. What are we seeing on the left there? Because it's not the black paper with the cutouts. It's white paper with uh, that ink was, or something. That was my, um, my drawing of her. I did like five drawings of her. And okay. then uh, when, I cut, when I do this drawing, I, I lay it on top of the black and then I do a basic cut out of my, the, my shape of my, after I've done my drawing. And then I take that away and then I cut the rest sort of just as it goes, just so I make sure she's where she needs to be. Okay. So I do make a drawing that I cut and- um, uh Oh, I'm sorry. I, my, my, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Ah, ah. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, this is one that's not in the hallway, that's inside the exhibit. Yes. It's in black and white. And Barbara was telling me that it's the, that the piece that is at Sam is sandblasted glass. Yeah, so it's, um, it's just regular plate glass, which I will not use again because I've just gotten a great sample of hand cast glass with black over it. So that's gonna be for the future. It's beautiful, gonna be beautiful. But this is plate glass with uh, a layer of uh, black enamel uh, baked on top of it. And then I put a frisket on top, cut the frisket, pulled the peat parts out and then sandblast. And that's how these images have um, this one on the side, the one on the, with the yellow behind it, that's, on, that's paper and that's gonna be for a different, uh, a different show. For the Henry. Okay, and I want people to notice that uh, that's the most uh, sinister figure that <laughs> I've seen so far, Barbara. Uh, the guy who's uh, screaming and gesturing with his hands that look like claws in the lower right. I mean, he looks like he wandered over, you should pardon the expression from a Kara Walker uh, cutout. Uh, so, uh, and he does appear in the sandblasted version, obviously. Yeah. yeah, he's there and he's actually going down and kind of picking at the stamen of a flower oh. that's on her back that's coming, that there are flowers around her. So she, he's, he's, he's sort of coming out of one flower and going into another. And I think in all my work, there are these, um, the elements of the sacred and the profane, these ideas that in everything, there is an element of the dark and light, you know, uh, and how we move through the world and how we move through danger and how we mitigate that danger. So I wanted to have that be with what is also beauty and what we consider as beauty. Yeah, I mean, there's this incredible tension, isn't there, between her innocence and sweetness, and then this, you know, this seriously threatening figure, but he's so small that, you know, he's kind of like in, the, he's like the background noise or something. Yeah, and this is my great niece, so that's who that is. Okay. Um, she, she lived with me, she would live with me for the last two years, and now she's off on her next adventure. Okay, so here's the... Here's what you'll see when you go to Sam. And as I say, you're gonna have a whole year to do this. So, um, um, uh, you know, we can go there later on in the spring when quote unquote, life is back to normal. Uh, so there's Wonder Boy on the left. So that one we already saw with him holding the book bag. 
Um, the one on the right, we haven't seen a picture of, but so these pictures line the corridor. The corridor as you walk up to the illuminated room and at the very apex there, you see at the very top, that's where you'll see the, the image grace is at the very top. And then you make that right and go into the gallery. Okay, so Grace is the one that's just opposite the door, in other words? It, it is. Okay. Um, and uh, so. Oh, there you are. So you see Geography of Innocence and you see Holding Fire right there by the wall text. So you've seen that. And then when you go into the room that you see right here, that's the, that's the hand cut room that I built. Yeah, and uh, this is your you know, work in progress while you're installing. I call it the epic install. Took seven and a half days. Whoa, that's a, that's a long time for an install. Well, you know, the room is a thousand square feet and I cut walls for the whole thing and then getting them all just right and getting them lined up and getting them so that they, you know, they touched and all of that, all those details take time. Is that, that's paper? It, it's Tyvek. Yeah. Yeah, those are huge sheets. And here's what it looks like. So this is the finished version. Yeah, and it's um, it's the, each, the from floor to bottom, it's 12 feet. So each panel is 12 feet. Each panel that I've cut is 12 feet and each one is four feet wide. So it took about 30 of these panels to surround the walls. The piece that's in the center is, um, that when you're looking straight on that piece that's called Bodies in the Matrix, that is comprised of two Tyvek sheets. So each one is four feet. So that's, you know, you've got your uh, eight feet across and then it's 12 feet from the bottom to the floor. So, so Tyvek is an insulation material? Is it building material or I, what? It is both, I made it, you know, people make, do, do things with Tyvek all the time. so. I, I actually, C.C. Cooning, if you know her work, um, mm -hmm. she's, a, she's, a, she's a, you know, she lives in Seattle. She does a lot of beautiful things with paper. And I saw some of her things years ago, at, you know, kind of hanging in one of Sam's spaces. And I called her and I said, well, how do you, you know, what are the upsides and the downsides of Tyvek? And I, so she told me, I mean, she didn't tell me how to do it. She just told me like, there's white and there's black and this is what you could do. And I said, okie dokie. So I decided that Tyvek, and the Tyvek was in those 2016 pieces that you saw that I cut the, mm -hmm. the large mm -hmm. figures from. So that, then I decided that what I wanted to do with Tyvek was create these spaces. And what's really great for me is that a lot of, you know, one of the, one of the things that has to happen for me is I have to be able to manage it and hold it and build it. And so I don't build with wood and metal all the time, unless it's going to be installed somewhere else. But if I'm doing something in my studio, then of course you want to have something that you can actually manage. And so I had about a kind of a group of six or seven people who would come in starting in, they started like, let's say last September helping me cut. So we cut from, you know, September, I was gone for actually October. And then until we got the COVID shut down, they were all here helping me cut the walls. And then once we got the COVID shut down, we were shut down for a while. Then I had a smaller crew of about three people who'd come because we worked outside. I, I built a little studio outside and we cut outside. Um, so I could only have one person here at a time. So that was another sort of like, let's make it a little more complicated. But um, the May girl, I oh, sure, sorry. go ahead. I'm sorry, I thought you had paused. I, I'm just curious, uh, and maybe I missed it. How long does it take to cut one of these panels? Because it's so intricate, it's just amazing. Oh, well, you know, um, we could cut a panel. It depends on how many we are. If there's three of us, we can get one almost done in one session. But if there aren't three of us, I would work on during the week, I would work on some part of it. And then they come in, my one person. So, I mean, we could get a panel done in one session if I had two people. Uh, uh -huh. We'd have to be pretty so and then that would be like they come at 10 and leave at four. So, but there are 29 panels here, 
around the walls. And the center one, that one was done prior. That's the only piece that was done before. And I showed that piece in Savannah in 2018. So that piece, was that piece did exist already. Uh, and Barbara, Barbara, the Tyvex all the same color. It's just the lights that are making it orange or white. Mm -hmm. it's a, the walls are painted kind of a golden for the room, which is about a thousand square feet. Mm -hmm. And it's lit from the bottom to the top. The piece in the center is lit from the top to the bottom. And it's with just kind of a cool white, kind of a cool white light. So that's the, that's the difference in color. It's, there's no, there's right. no color in the paper. Yeah, so what we're seeing here, so the, we've got glass art to the left and right. So those are the two sandblasted portraits. There are three actually, there are three sandblasted um, kind of stations, one on either side and one right behind this centerpiece that you can't see. Oh, we can't see, okay. That's and, Bailey. Uh, Bailey's behind there, she's back there. Okay, and uh, then there's candelabras, which Barbara yeah. also designed, I'm assuming. I did. And they're sandblasted as well. Uh, and then there's the tower in the middle and then there's the walls. So Barbara, what's the narrative link in your mind? So you're walking down this corridor and you're experiencing all these, you know, super appealing young kids with all this color and, you know, all these symbolic elements and a lot of language. And then you walk into this main space. There's almost no language and almost no portraiture, just this kind of glow. And then the, I'm assuming falling figures, falling adult figures in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all the way around. It's, 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 in, it's, it's, a, it's a rectangle actually. And it actually was supposed to be open, but because of COVID, it was supposed to be that you could go inside that tower, but because of COVID, we couldn't open it because the space would be too, Mm -hmm. um, would be too tight, you know, and, and, and it might not be good for breathing. So I had to close it. And, but it, it's fine because you can walk around it. It's like a freestanding um, luminaria. Yeah, so um, here there's, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna go back to that view in a second. I just wanted to show them, you get to go inside. Yeah. <laughs> here you are inside. Anyway, um, so it, it, what's the narrative link um, in your mind, and every viewer is going to have their own version. Exactly. In your mind, though, what's the narrative link between the chapel space? It's like the Rothko Chapel. In my, you know, my. That's how I'm kind of looking at it, and and what we experience approaching it through the portraits. Well, for me, I feel like as the person who gets to create the those images, I also want to create <laughs> the context in which my viewer can be disarmed. And when you're disarmed, that means you're vulnerable and perhaps you're able to see and feel the atmosphere in a way that you might not if you were not being held in such a kind of unworldly kind of atmosphere. And then you're able to look at things and there's a, from the direction that we're looking right here, there is an image right behind you. And that piece is called the Book of Cures. There's a, a figure and she's holding a book and it's the Book of Cures. And for me, I want my audience to feel a sense of wonder, a sense of curiosity, uh, maybe an opportunity to relook at things that they might not have seen before. And, um, so then you have the kids again, the child on the right, the left there, her name is Ama. And on the other side, there are two boys. And these are all kids of friends. So Ama is a friend of the, the daughter of a really good friend. And the two boys on the other side, they're called the flowers and they're friends of my friend of, of mine that I went to college with. So those are their boys and then Bailey behind. But in a way, again, it's all about light and dark and the fact that you couldn't have this beauty without having both the light and the dark and that the shadows create the atmosphere. And so when you're looking at it, it's the balance. And if you're thinking about, you know, what is negative, what is positive space, 
there's kind of a joint kind of interplay that allows you to maybe suspend a little bit of your um, preconceived notion. That's it. That makes sense? Yeah. I mean, it really feels like um, kind of the culmination of the service, you know, where it's, it's like, boom, you go into this light room, this light filled space, and there's all this movement and color, and the organ is playing in the background. It's sort of like revelation. You know, I mean, well, it's, a, it's another reveal, you know, I'm cutting, I'm revealing the color, I'm cutting, I'm revealing. And what I wanted with that big piece in the middle, you step inside, I reveal once more, and you go darker, you go in and you go in and you go in. And that is what I think for me, you know, when, what can you do with your mind? What can you do with your experience, but to push yourself to go deeper, and to think more, uh, I don't know, get outside of your preconceived notion. And I think you know, just getting knocked off your balance just a little bit allows the viewer to at least have a possibility of doing that. Are there questions here, you guys? Please ask me questions if you have any. Um, oh, yes. Um, yes, well, is there a catalog for this show? We're putting it together right now because you know that we couldn't do the catalog until the piece was installed because I actually didn't know what the piece was actually going to look like until it got installed. So we got all the photos now. So we're putting that together now. Okay. And Mark on Press is going to do it. Yeah, they're the best. They do all the key art books for the area. Yeah, so they're great. So there will be. And I, um, you know, so it's, uh, and the other thing I will say is that, um, my cutters, the people that come to work with me, they're not necessarily artists. They're just people who, some of the people I just wanted to know. Um, they're between 15 years old and 75. You know, uh, we have a good time and we get to know each other around. A, a, what, what, do, what does a cutter cut with? Uh, what is it? Just the what is it? The knife? The a little exacto? A little exacto knife? Or exacto. Has it got some heft to no. it? No, it's just an exacto knife. Then we just have an exacto knife and we change our blades often. I said there is no economy in cutting with a dull blade. <laughs> There's none, and so we change our blades often. And um, I've met some really wonderful people. Uh, through the cutting and um, they're all when you go to the the museum you'll see, you know on that wall there all of my cutters are listed on the wall everybody I worked with on making glass are listed on the wall uh, people I worked with so they're all listed there so you'll see their names uh, hi Bar Barbara it's Modder Snell hi, How are you hi hi it's fantastic and I love that it is so filled with light and hope in this dark time. It is incredibly beautiful. Thank you for your gift. Modern, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Yeah, well. Wait, Modern, did you already get to see it before it closed? No, it was only up for three days. Yeah, yeah. no, okay, so you're waiting too, yeah. I'm um, waiting. Oh, uh, Barbara, let's just go through the last few slides because okay. yep. they're kind of details of the falling bodies. Um, and uh, you can see that body more clearly. And here's a close up of the, I, I mean, I think of them as fountains. That's what they uh, are, they're actually fountains. And you know, and I, and I have them so that, so nothing has to be like exact. I just have these areas where I sit at 24, 48, you know, that I have people, we kind of would gear the thing so that the arrows would go and hit that 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 you know measurement but otherwise you know there's no like the guy when we were installing he says the world are they in any kind of order i said no they're interchangeable <laughs> um any comments though before we all you know before we finish the slides and open it up for a few last questions about the falling bodies and and what that imagery means to you um uh mm -hmm. is it you know, I mean, are, are we talking apocalypse or revelation or somewhere in between? I don't know. Uh, what do you, what do you guys 
guy named I've seen Julie Glass kind of hanging like that, but that's how how sturdy is that? It's very, you know, it's you mean the the, the whole thing? The, the no, cloth? I mean the, the hanging figures that are the there's like a hanging sculpture in the you middle mean, there. In the middle, you mean hanging from the ceiling? Uh yeah. I assume yes. That is actually a uh, paper. And I take the paper and I cut it in these long sort of kind of flowing things. And then I, you know, just like I would take it and then I would take a, a ruler and then I make it curl. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, just take it and make it curl. And so I'd make different ones and make it long then I'd make them curl. And then when I get up there on the ladder, when I go up there and I said, if it's not curling the right way, I take the, take the, the uh, ruler and make it curl another way. So it's just like curling your hair. And I don't care what anybody else sees in those. Those are clouds. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Those so, are clouds. And so I was kind of sorry not to be able to have it. But you know, you just got to roll with it. You can't get too, too caught up on what you don't have and try to hope. So that, that was the experience. Because when you go inside, it would just get more quiet and more quiet until you were inside. And actually, three or four people could stand inside because it's that big. Because it's, you know, it's like, you know, eight feet on one side and you know, five feet on the other. So it, it, it's, it's, it's not a small space. And I wanted people to go in one side and then come out the other. So you see one of the portraits when you go in and you see another portrait when you come out and then you see the portrait that's right behind. Well, you know, Barbara, it's still possible, you know. Yeah, well, you know. It, we might be able to get into it before yeah. the show runs out. Yeah, we'll so, be super powered because we're going to have our vaccines. Yeah, so anyway, that's, that's the show. Um, and um, I'm, I'm actually pleased with it. And you know, one of the things about, you know, the, again, cutting of the walls and all that you don't, it's, it's really fun for me. What I didn't get to see was a lot of my cutters see all of it up. Oh you, yeah. They, they only see it one late, they only see it one panel at a time. And then we roll it up one panel at a time. So many of them, um, just have no idea what it was what they're making but that's another thing you know they come in and they just work on faith I said here there's this thing you got to do you got to you know cut pay attention don't bleed on it until you know are we making maybe we can all bleed on it that'd be good and so um it's it, it, it was a really intense and wonderful experience to work with the people and you know, Barbara, I don't know whether I'm being fair or not gender wise, but if I think about all the artists who love the collaborative process of art making, uh, I, th I think I'm thinking a lot more women examples than male examples like, the, I don't, you know, I mean, uh, you know, like uh, the dinner party, you know, uh, Judy Chicago had a million people working on that. And there's- but Let me just say one thing. All my cutters are paid. Okay. No, there's no free work here. Everybody gets paid and they have to commit to coming at least three sessions, you know, before we go. So, so that I don't end up, you know, somebody comes and they're kind of all nervous. And then by the time they're all ready, then, oh no, I can't come now. I've got to go do whatever. So it's really a commitment. And, uh, and so I want them to commit and, that just allows there to be a level of seriousness that, um, I mean, it's not a lot of money. I mean, I, you know, you know, 15 or $16 an hour, but it's something and it's um, every week. And so I have, you know, young people, old people, you know, just people and we have a good time. Uh, you have great conversations. <laughs> yeah, we dance, we sing, we cut ourselves, we bleed. It's, you know, and at the end, um, you know, what we do is when you're cutting, I move people around. So someone will start cutting at the beginning, maybe on this side of the table. And then after 20 minutes, I move them to the other side so that no one's working on one area. So when you look at it, it kind of has the sense of, you know, all being one thing. But of course, when I look at it, I can tell exactly. It's like a hand signature. I can tell exactly whose cut it is. You know. Um, okay, so um, uh, Barbara has 
been super generous in working with me on this. And she's had a very, very, very busy year, as she was telling me, uh, and you can imagine. And she's going to take some much deserved time off. <laughs> I don't know, not probably not really after this. But we have any last questions before we uh, let Barbara go? Yeah. Comments, questions, suggestions, as we used to say when we do our book, our book report. <laughs> to Andrea, thank you too. Uh, and we'll thank Erica, who is our tech support person. Mm -hmm. um, well, Barbara, I just wanted to ask you quickly about the falling figures. Uh, you know, what kind of apocalypse is going on in your mind with with this giant tower with all the with all the toppling bodies? Well, I, you know, I wrote this piece uh, years ago and it was uh, kind of the whole idea of the fact that the way we move through life, you know, there's this web, you know, that kind of holds us, but we move through it, you know, we move through it and we're kind of tumbling. And on that tumble, you know, we meet people, we run into people, we encounter people. And that if you were to, if you were there and you go see the, and you see the people, they, they kind of go in and out of the border. You know, there's this, this, I think it was about a 16 inch border around the whole thing. And that the, the whole sort of configuration comes from the fact that um, I like the whole idea of the illuminated manuscript where you have this border of the illuminated manuscript and in the border, there are all these subtext again going on of what's happening in the world. And then there's the main, you know, drama of people moving through their lives. And so to me, that's just what it is. And you'll see some of the characters are holding other characters in their hands. They're handing a character off. They're encountering um, any number of, um, you know, sort of insects and everything that you can find in the world. So for me, it's not so much apocalypse because when you see the people, they're not the least bit ter in terror because they have the matrix, which is holding them. So they're not free falling. They're actually, you know, caught in that matrix and they're moving through those sort of fan figures, that fan shapes. So it, 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 it's not a feeling when, at least the way I read it, when I see it of people falling into some abyss, it, it's more kind of they're in the free flow of what happens in any day. And actually what can happen in any day is, you know, kind of like who you bump into and what you encounter. And so that's kind of part of, uh, I thought it went well with the rest of my theme. Okay, I like that yeah. explanation. Yeah. But they just don't get to leave or go up and out. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I feel like, you know, it's, it's probably, because I don't know, I mean, gravity is real. <laughs> and so, yep. Yep. I mean, you know, and actually this piece was designed to be, you'll go, you'll see it's rolled. It's really 14 feet long, but the, the height of the ceiling in this room is only 12. So when I had it before it was uh, 14 and a half feet um, um, from, the, from the floor. So they're kind of, people kind of fall into kind of a, um, kind of a watery sort of catch. So it, it's not a hard, it's not a hard, they're not falling to the concrete. Okay. Yeah. All right, everybody. So unless there's any last questions or comments, we'll let Barbara go. Thank you so much, Barbara and everybody Thank else for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and we'll see everybody at the Seattle Art Museum. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Let's see each other at the Art Museum. That'll be good. Let's see each other outside of our house and outside of our pajamas. So there you go. <laughs> you film people that walk okay. in there, that walk in there and see that for the first time, the awe on their faces. Well, you know, again, I haven't gotten to see too many people because I wasn't there. I didn't go to the, um, to the uh, preview, but I did see, of course, um, there were a few tours of people. And I'm just, you know, I, I love seeing it. And I love having people tell me what they see and what they think it's about, because that's exactly what it's about. Okay. It certainly isn't about them guessing what I was thinking. And um, that kind of completes the circle for me. And sometimes people see things that then help 
me go to the next one because they'll see things that I haven't seen. So that's the that's the joy of being alive while it's here. When I'm gone, I can't hear that. So there you go. Oh, who knows? Okay. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Barbara. See everybody later. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, 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 -bye